Take it easy, bye. Thanks, Adam, that was really funny. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Sam Breed, and uh, I'm gonna be talking today about uh, Backbone and React Forever Together. I've retitled this talk to, to a couple times, so I'm not 100% sure what the title is. The, the original title was supposed to be Backbone View is a Joke, but um, I figured that that wasn't a good way to win favor when I was submitting my talk to this conference. So, um, but you know, this is really a, uh, a story actually about um, about a year and a half I spent um, ferreting out good performance in a really 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 large backbone app and um, what I discovered along the way is that um, backbone view does so little for you that it's actually comical um, and it's not backbone views fault so don't take this as an indictment of, of what backbone view is doing I've built a lot of really cool apps that use it heavily um, particularly the talk yesterday um, from, uh, that Matt gave from Pitchfork, Pitchfork was, uh, was really impressive, you know, a cool, cool use of, of backbone views. So for about the past year and a half, I've been working on an application called Sprintly. It's project management software. So basically, it's a big Kanban board to help developers and product managers talk about what they're building and what they want to build. And Sprintly started life in 2011, actually well before I was involved with the project. I knew a few people that worked on it. But um, so it says established 2010, it was really 2011. Um, so, so right, like Sprintly started as the way that a lot of ambitious or soon to be ambitious web apps start. It started as a big sea of jQuery selector soup. So, you know, couple dozen files, lots and lots and lots of just raw jQuery code, which totally worked for prototyping purposes, and they actually managed to build a pretty impressive app with it. Enter Backbone. So Sprintly adopted Backbone at in the 0 0.5 release. Um, who here has been using Backbone that long? Show of hands. Okay. It's impressive that you guys are still here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so right, the uh, the zero point five release of Backbone, you know, definitely had some had some flaws in it. It was really really easy to create memory leaks, and it was uh, it was kind of a hard upgrade path to get from that release to uh, to where Backbone is at today, um, which soon to be one point two, right? So Sprintly started life, you know, as first a jQuery app, and then it got some structure refactored into it. It got a module system along the way. It used uh, used require JS for qu quite a long time, and so what that really enabled the app to do is get just a tiny bit of structure, and then add in lots and lots and lots of code. Sprintly, it turns out, is an enormous app, and by the time that I started working on it uh, in the summer of 2013, it was an even bigger app than it was when they con first converted to Backbone. I'm talking like hundreds of files, you know dozens of views, dozens of models, and it was really, really hard to uh, make heads and tails of it. So there was a lot of duplicated code, and you know, this is really what happens when you kind of like let software entropy take hold in a large product. Sp Sprintly is a complicated product, and you know, while they were innovating and adding features and listening to customer feedback, no one was paying too close attention to the kind of state of the of the code from like a cleanliness perspective, you know, the module system really just allowed us to you know make a treasure trove of all of these junk drawers where we had views and, and classes that you know were seven, eight hundred, sometimes two thousand lines long, that you don't know what was in them. You get blame it, and it's some contractor that's like you know long gone with a cloud of dust and a person shaped hole left in their wake. So. Don't leave apps unattended is one of those first things. And you know, if you don't, uh, I've said this before in, in talks, um, you know, software entropy and code debt are stuff that you know it happens because people are going quickly. It happens because maybe you're a little lazy. Maybe you want to get out the door at, f at 5 p.m. on a Friday. But um, software entropy really sucks because it can pull down your application's performance, especially on the front end, in a really, really raw way. And you know the overwhelming thing about this code base was that it was fine when they first wrote it. Like from a performance perspective, like 
things worked really well, you know, and when you tested the app out for, from like a QA pers perspective, so Sprintly is basically like a big Kanban board, right? And uh, you can drag and drop cards, you know, the kind of like maximum number of cards that we were dealing with, what, like in our like QA environment and our staging environment was, you know, like maybe 30 or 40. And we felt like that was a lot. And then we looked at our data and we realized that people, uh, some of our customers were leaving, you know, hundreds of cards on their Kanban board all the time. And in some cases, even more than a thousand cards. And each one of those cards is a backbone view. Each one of those cards had event bindings in it. And each one of those cards was like instrumented with a jQuery UI drag and drop. So all of these expensive things, you know, essentially amounted to um, a thousand paper cuts or rather a thousand wax with a hammer. So Big Bang rewrites are, are pretty terrible and they're really, really difficult to do. Um, so we were kind of in a state where some of our largest customers that really, really liked the, the application found that it was really unusable based on the way that they were using it. And you know, changing user behavior, especially when it's a tool that they're in every day, that they're really used to, it's really difficult. We, and we didn't, have, we, you know, didn't have the balls to say like, no, you, you're really doing this wrong. You shouldn't have a thousand of anything on, on the screen at one time. Like, these are really difficult problems. We kind of just had to suck it up and make sure that uh, the app would keep on performing well. So, but we couldn't do that by rewriting it. You know, too much time and too much effort had been spent just to get the app functional to, you know, the place where it was when, when I joined the Sprintly team last year. And so what did we start doing? So, you know, first I looked at the view layer. And, you know, the view layer has, has a lot of, you know, kind of loosely related concepts uh, thrown together. You know, things like subviews, your templating layer, event handlers, data binding, most importantly, testing. All of these things kind of work against one another, unfortunately, if you don't have the right organizational structure, and if you really, you know, don't take great care to make sure that these things are managed in a really pristine way, you're gonna be in for a really, really bad time. And views create side effects. Um, in Henrik's talk this morning, he was talking about, you know, the DOM is essentially this, you know, big kind of mutable global state. Oh, boy. Um, not going to touch it now. I'll stand back here and put my hands behind my back. Um, so, right, like, everything you do in the DOM seems like it creates a side effect. Everything you do in a backbone view seems like it's, like, creating a side effect. Like you can just kind of, if you code review a lot, and I code review um, a lot of code for, for Quick Left and for Sprintly, um, you know, you just kind of see these view methods and like everything in them, every single line is like calling out to some other thing, it's writing to the DOM, it's, you know, using a jQuery plugin or something. Those things are really hard to test and the testing is the, is the layer that like falls, the bottom falls out first and you stop doing it, you get lazy. And so, you know, groups of views have natural structures that, that you know, like if you're, if you're diligent, you're not just using one monolithic view or backbone view for your, for your application. You've got a whole bunch of them. They're forming a tree. You're, you know, kind of writing an application that in some ways, you know, mirrors what's going on in the DOM, right? So you've got all of these sub views, but then you kind of run into the problem of creating memory leaks of, you know, build up and tear down becoming really, really expensive if you're trying to, you know, create a thousand item cards on the page inside of, you know, the first couple seconds that the application's loading. So these kind of patterns are, are emergent. They, you know, form in an organic way while you're building your application. And these things kind of what amount to, you know, a situation that's really unfortunate, but it's not really anyone's fault, you know? And uh, even though you can get blame and, you know, hate, hate the folks that wrote the code before you because it's, you know, riddled with bugs and it's, you know, not performing and it's like, what, what are they thinking? That doesn't help either. You know, you've kind of got to, you got to strike out and either, you know, fix the stuff on your own or find something else that you can put into your app in a progressive way. And so some of the early optimizations that I did when I was working on the Sprintly app I kind of followed along this trajectory. So the first thing that I always look at in an application that's, that's not performing very well is the templating layer. Like, you know, the, unfortunately, when, when we all kind of, the, the templating renaissance of 2010 and 2011 happened, where you had like, you know, dozens and dozens of new fancy templating libraries coming out, a new one every week, right? Like, 
they were all had these examples of like putting them in a script tag and then compiling them like in the job in the browser runtime and then like using them. And that's like one of the worst things that you can try to do when you're initializing your application because that's when you're doing literally everything else to initialize your app. Like you're fetching data from the server, you're rendering all of your views. And so like it's just this time that you can shave off, you know, like in the tens of milliseconds usually if you have complex if you have complex complex templates or enough of them. And so I you know, I did that and that was, you know, a pretty easy quick win and it really was, you know, just kind of a uh, you know, it was like hitting an elephant with a fly swatter. It wasn't really doing, it didn't even move, didn't even notice it. The app was still performing like complete shit. So, uh, so then I, I kind of went a little further. And, you know, the things that I went through were frame budget trickery. So thank God the Chrome Dev Tools had released their, uh, their memory profiling and their like performance frame rate profiling stuff la last summer, because without that, I would have been completely screwed. And I realized it's like, oh yeah, I'm trying to do, you know, 500 milliseconds of rendering inside of a single frame. Like, of course it's hanging up and I can't scroll for two seconds, right? Like, so there are a bunch of things that, you know, we started adding in, you know, getting our rendering flow within a backbone app, within our backbone app to be as asynchronous as possible. Um, so, you know, what that means is like adding, you know, uh, underscore has this great method, uh, defer in it that, you know, it's just a set timeout with zero, right? But it kicks something forward far enough so that, you know, if you're doing a lot of complex rendering work, you know, it will usually be the solve that will, you know, heal that wound a little bit. We went back to using native DOM methods for a lot of stuff and actually like doing things that were, you know, kind of unsafe. We realized that when we were tearing down views, the call stack was like a yard deep because there was, you know, all of these kind of jQuery protections and, you know, recursively walking the DOM to make sure that it was cleaning up all of its, like, data bindings and all that, and all that crazy stuff that, you know, we love jQuery for because, like, those are things that ultimately make your app really efficient, but they can also really, really slow your app down. And it's, like, so perplexing that it's, like, hold on, the reason why I'm having, like, you know, chuggy frame rate when I'm, like, switching views is because I'm removing stuff out of the DOM? It seemed really counterintuitive at the time super, super annoying. Fixing memory leaks, you know, the, that's uh, the kind of old classic nightmarish tale of like using, you know, the early releases of Backbone is that you would, you know, you discover that you can like bind on to all these great model events and you can have this life cycle that, you know, takes your program, your application from being, you know, primarily something that is like procedural if you're like coming from like a jQuery like selector soup app to something that's um, that's more evented and kind of feels like more natural, like feels like an MVC, right? But, you know, those things, like Jeremy talked about it yesterday when he went through the deep dive of like the event system and, you know, it, before Listen 2, you just kind of had all of these kind of manual bindings on and off and they were really hard to hunt down and not everybody working on the application kind of understood like how to even find what a memory, where a memory leak is, you know, and kind of what the, the, the lengths you have to go to to chase those things down are still kind of annoying, even with the modern dev tool stacks in Chrome and Firefox. jQuery plugins are great, but they are kind of a terrible hellscape when you get into them and you use enough of them. Um, and like with jQuery UI, you, you know that you're using it because you're looking at the source every 15 minutes when you're trying to solve problems. Um, so, you know, we had a bunch of jQuery plugins that were, you know, kind of brought in really innocently, and then we're doing things that were hurting performance. We had, you know, heavy use of jQuery UI drag and drop, which is really fantastic, and I've used, I've used it and abused it for years, but, you know, it's also really expensive to do. So there are all these kind of things that, like, <laughs> a rough combination of those techniques, we've threw them together, made all of our rendering super asynchronous, made sure that we were waiting as long as possible to, um, to turn on drag and drop on elements, and basically like getting really militant about not introducing um, UI changes that were going to you know, kind of drive over that surface area of performance, which for us is literally the whole app. So, and then we got to the dreaded double render. I'll render this again just to just to prove the point. Um, so the the double render happens 
in your Backbone app. I almost guarantee it. The, uh, so what happens is that, right, you've bound your render method to an event, to like a change event on, on a model or a sync event. And, you know, it seems great. Stuff works right away. You know, you, your Ajax call comes back from the server, your page renders, you see new data. That's awesome. And then it happens again and again, and sometimes four or five more times just for good measure. And we're doing things that um, kind of um, magnified and, and made this problem way worse than it otherwise would have been because we were using um, so some extensions to backbone collections to allow us to have like a single master collection that you know was heavily filtered down to the uh, so that we can you know have one god collection and then every and then all of these other collections are just views so they share all the same models in memory we probably should have used supermodel but we didn't um, somebody else chose something kind of lame and it made it so that like all of our events were firing like four or five times and I looked at this and the first day I saw it I like had to pull other people over I'm like look when you drag an item card from one column to the other not only does it needlessly re-render every single card on the page it does it like seven times <laughs> so the um, you if and if you're not looking for this stuff the app your app will just appear to be working and it's probably double rendering. And if you if you're looking if you feel like your frame rate's getting chunky, just like put a console.count in your render method and see how many times it fires off. So this is the code part of the talk, I guess. Um, so this is like a really naive implementation of a uh, of a backbone view with, with a render method, right? Like obviously this is like four lines of code, so it's nowhere near complete. But um, you know, this is kind of the pattern that we followed quite a bit, right? We have a pre-compiled template that we're pulling in with, uh, that we're pulling in with like, in this case, it would be a, uh, like a Browserify extension to compile the handlebars template, you know, at, uh, at compile time rather than at runtime. And then, you know, we're, we're just dumping the whole thing into, uh, in, into the jQuery element for, that the views associated with, dumping out the models to JSON. And so, I haven't talked about React much yet in this talk, and I promise that I'm getting to it. Um, so I just wanted to show kind of like the equivalent React thing. I know Henrik talked about it a little bit earlier today. But um, so like the equivalent React view is um, not too much more code, except the, the main difference is that like the template you can see is just like, you know, slapped in there in line in the middle of the function. Um, Unfortunately, this is like aesthetically the least appealing thing about React when you first see it. And I will, I will admit that at JSConf in uh, 2012, 2013, um, when they first like announced React and the Facebook guys were up on stage and really excited about it, I was laughing like an asshole in the back row <laughs> because I was like, yeah, XML, that seems like a great idea, guys. Um, so. Uh, yeah, Adam remembers that. Um, so I, so I, I have to officially apologize today because I kind of looked at it at face value and didn't realize that there was there's something else going on here. And it's actually something you know aside from like the transformation, like the source code transformation, the JSX com compilation step that you have to go through. What this is really doing is putting the context of your template back into the view. And you know, we kind of like that first kind of preliminary early optimization step that I was talking about, right? Where like we take this uh, this template file, and you know, we make sure that's not just like sitting like raw in a script tag on your page, waiting to be like precompiled at runtime. Like we put it off in another file. You know, for if, if we're being good about organizing things, we maybe have it close by to where we are. You know, actually storing storing this view, but still, it's in a separate file. And these templates can get really, really big if you're doing complex stuff, especially if you're, you know, needing to have lots of conditionals in them. If you know they're, like, if you ever like open up Sprintly and like look through like the DOM, like our DOM is super complex. It's you know heavily designed, and it could probably get refactored. But it's like when you're building features, solving bugs, and like chasing down these terrible performance problems because customers are churning out of your application. You know, like the last thing that you're going to do is being like, okay, well, yeah, let's go clean up every single template. Well, we have 500 of them, and they're all enormous. So, 
putting the template into the context of your view layer is actually something that ends up being really beneficial. You don't have to have, you know, uh, and like four splits open in your editor to look at two views, like, right? You know, I end up with this problem all the time in like in backbone apps where I'm just like looking at like half a dozen files at once just so that I can have the right context so that I can solve the, fix the bug that I'm trying to solve or kind of reason about figuring out the lay of the land. So this JSX kind of inline, uh, I think gets a really bad rap. And if this is what's holding you up from like wanting to use React or wanting to give it a try, I really encourage you to um, try to look past this. Because at the end of the day, all of this just gets compiled down to function calls. And the function calls are a huge pain in the ass to write. Like using the JSX compilation step is a, actually turns out a really good idea. So the next thing we're going to look at is, again, another naive implementation that's missing a bunch of stuff. Don't expect to run this code. Um, but you know, I, I was talking earlier about views having structure and kind of naturally forming into a hierarchy. It's based on the DOM, and you know, it's based on you know, kind of a, a smart, reasonable way to structure your application into something approaching you know, uh, swappable components, especially in Sprintly. Again, you know, big Kanban board. We have item cards everywhere. Item cards appear like, on every single view of the application. And if we duplicated all of the code for them everywhere it would be, this one megabyte app would probably be a 10 megabyte app. So this is, again, a naive implementation where we're saying, like, Okay, I'm going to loop over a collection, and again, you should probably be using Marionette to do something like this, but if you have an application and you are doing this manually, this is the part where you should perk up your ears and pay attention. Um, so right, you know, we're, we're initializing, we're initializing like a new item card view, we're making sure that it's cached so that, you know, we, we don't like double, we don't double instantiate it because that's super expensive, and then we're ultimately like, Rend mapping over the collection, rendering a view for every one of those, dumping those things out into the DOM. And this gets a lot simpler in, in React. Um, this is something where React, especially when you use it with Backbone or put it into an already existing Backbone app, you get some benefits of like the built-in um, the built-in underscore methods that are associated with collections, where you go from you know kind of having to do either manual bookkeeping, pulling in a dependency like a marionette or layout manager, to really you know just have something where it's like okay well this this uh, this back this React view will will accept a uh, a collection, it expects it as a property, it would blow up without it. Um, and then maps over it and returns um, some more JSX, which is just an element in our item card view. The item card view is what we were looking at a little bit earlier. So again, this is something that, you know, at, at first blush, I was like, you know, really not into the JSX thing. But then I was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. This seems like I'm actually able to use and reuse components at will without having to go through a bunch of histrionics to make it work with backbone views or with pulling in like yet another dependency. React is like complete, you, you have to, like it's a big dependency, right? Like it's not small. It does a lot for you. In my experience though, like it's, it hasn't yet been the straw that broke the camel's back and Sprintly has like a bajillion dependencies. So what's one more? <laughs> but so, you know, this when I was preparing for this talk, this kind of got me thinking along the lines of like, you know, why Backbone in the first place? And I think uh, John, John Paul, who's not here today, had a, you know, a really good talk yesterday that uh, where he kind of describes like this, you know, progressive learning about you know going from from prototype to jQuery to to Backbone to Angular and then eventually to, to Ember. And I went through a, a really similar uh, phase. You know, I started writing JavaScript with Prototype and then, you know, I learned jQuery and was really excited about it, you know, got involved in the jQuery community and stuff. And Backbone really does represent this awesome, you know, kind of building block that you can use as, as a crutch to learn how to make sensible applications. And, you know, it, it, batteries don't come included with it, though. So it's not something where you're going to you know, literally write an application without writing any code like John, like John was showing us yesterday. Like, that's really cool, it's really whiz-bang, but like, 
I don't, I, I would question how much you're really learning when you're just kind of like using entirely like batteries included off the shelf tools. Anyway, so, you know, React, I think, is, uh, is another incremental building block because while it is doing something that is quite complex, and I avoided putting the term virtual DOM in my slides, but I'll talk about it a little bit. You know, Facebook had this problem where like every feature that they were shipping had some like visual impact like on the on like they're build a fucking web app like you know and a really performance sensitive one like look at look, scroll through your scroll through your feed if you're a Facebook user and like look at how many images are on there look at you know videos that are auto playing they've got a native chat they've got like a chat app in there like they're doing really really complex stuff and when you have literally thousands of engineers how do you guarantee that like what the new guy is committing when he fixes a bug isn't going to hose performance on your whole page. Well, you get a group of the, of the best kind of developers and you make them solve this front end problem. I think that the solution that React came up with is really novel and really unique. And uh, again, Henrik talked about it a little bit the, this morning with regards to you know, how, how it can be emulated and how you can, you know, can kind of pull the, pull the best parts of it out. But it already exists, and Facebook is really going whole hog into it. So you know, it's something that if it's if it's good enough for their you know hundreds of engineers that have to ship front end features all the time, it's probably good enough it, for for you to try using, especially if you're dealing with things that are performance sensitive. So the reasons why I think React is uh, is is really attractive. Or first and foremost, the performance. You know, we've started refactoring parts of Sprintly to use React, and essentially, it obviates the needs to have uh, to have myself spend like you know slaving over code reviews for hours to make sure that they're not going to have performance impact. Having to you know teach all the developers at Quick Left that end up touching sh Sprintly code, you know what to watch out for, how to you know use the timelines panel in their dev tools. Like they all know that, but it's not kind of like you know, the the day-to-day -day course of what they're doing to, you know, kind of closely, mon hawkishly monitor performance in their app. So that's one. Components is another. You know, React essentially, everything, the, the only things you create are components, and React components can be consumed by other React com components. And essentially, once you start using React on your page, it becomes turtles all the way down. And when we start first started using this and refactoring it into some apps that already existed, backbone apps that is, um, it became really obvious like how to refactor these views and how to split them up into, into their kind of like base primitive components and then how to enforce, enforce the properties that they're receiving and then how to write tests for them. And these are things that like doing it in raw backbone views just seemed, just seemed like insurmountable. You know, we're not going to componentize every single little thing, especially if we're only using it maybe one or two places. It's just too much work. And so, you know, what's what's fallen out of this is that like we've actually contributed uh, more open source than we usually do, specifically around React components, because it just makes sense. It's like, oh, well, you have a calendar widget, pull it out and make it a component, put it on, put it on GitHub, put it on npm. So browserify. Is, uh, is, is, a really, is a really slick tool. How many, uh, show of hands, how many people use Browserify? That's not nearly enough. Um, I, hear web, I hear really good things about Webpack too. But Browserify, right, uses the NPM ecosystem, uh, uses common JS. It um, essentially just works. And I've been a big fan of modules in JavaScript for a long time. And I have to apologize to all the people that I recommended to use Require.js because even though Require is really cool, it kind of gets you into um, a pretty terrible configuration loop, feedback loop where you just have like these very esoteric config files. You probably have one of more, more than one of them if you're like actually writing tests. You have you know these kind of asynchronous bugs that or you know kind of breaks in unpredictable ways and. Ultimately, if you're using Require.js, you end up with a Require.js expert on your team because you have to. So Browserify really uh, eliminates the need for that, for that entirely. In my experience, it works out of the box just fine. And React um, essentially goes out of its way to play nicely with, with Browserify. And so the JSX transform is available as a Browserify transform called Reactify. 
And you, now you can even use uh, some ES6 things like uh, destructuring assignment, uh, splat arguments, uh, the short object syntax, which I'm a big fan of. And these things, they're behind a flag still, but um, you can start using that stuff just out of the box because the ecosystem is nice and it lets you do it and it's not you know, hyper constrictive. Facebook, another compelling reason to do it. I talked about that a little bit already. And so what this led to at Sprintly and at QuickLeft in general and a lot of the work that I do with, with clients is a movement towards SDKs. It really forced us to think about like where the complexity in our application sits and how it's dependent on one another. And you know, most front-end MVC apps look something like this, where you have you know, a medium-sized stack of models, of models or collections. You have a thinner stack of routers and controllers, and then you have an unending, never end, <laughs> like enormous jumbo size stack of views. Lots and lots and lots of views. So the, what, what I mean by a movement towards SDKs are that you know, we realized that we could actually split out the model and collection layer of our application and make it work with our cores API. And it meant that we could start writing, uh, you know, really kind of rich, complicated applications that, that build or, and are additive on top of all of the other work that we had done in the model and collection, in the data layer of our application. And Backbone's a really small dependency. So it's, you know, kind of represents this really nice um, kind of separation of concerns. And you can also make that stuff open source. You can make it available to your, to your customers directly. And you know, this is something that, you know, when we first started thinking about this, it seemed like, okay, well, are people actually going to use it? And then we found that, you know, since we've started working on the project, we've had customers that like have bypassed asking us questions about the API because we've provided the tooling that comes out of the box and just works and is more than just, you know, a call to a to an Ajax endpoint, but rather something that like imbibes a collection and gives you, you know, some really, really rich uh, functionality out of the box. And then on the application side, it allows us to focus on cleaning up that view layer and on reducing the overall cognitive load that it takes to to get into the application. So this work's not not yet complete, but when it is, we'll be able to take out you know probably a, probably two dozen files or something. Just take them out of the application and have it be a dependency that is uh, is pulled in for, via npm. So some other cool stuff about React prop enforcement. I put explanation points to make this stuff exciting. Um, so so property enforcement. Is, uh, is something that's it's near and dear to my heart. Last year, I, I gave a talk here about dependency injection. And uh, Jeremy tweeted afterwards that dependency inje injection isn't a thing in Backbone. So I'll, I'll also recant that and just call it dependency enforcement. Enforcing that the things that you expect a class to have when you create it is a really, really good, good idea. It's eminently testable. And so when I saw the property enforcement in React, I was like, well, hey, that's really cool. Like, instead of having to build your own stuff to make that happen, which I've done, you know, half a dozen times over, and then finally released it as an ampersand module. Um, the, uh, this is just something that, like, made, made my heart fill with joy because it's, like, really nice. Um, the one thing that I should say is that it's actually really similar to the prop enforcement syntax that comes with happy JS is module joy. And I wish that they were compatible, but they're not. But it's really similar. Slightly slight differences though. Mixins. Mixins are pretty cool. It allows you to do something like this, where you can literally take the backbone events object as is off the shelf, toss it into a React class, and just have it work as you as you would expect it to. Um, this is one of the ways that we've made it uh, you know, really seamless to, you know, kind of translate some of our old view code into new view code. And the, the mix-in system is, uh, is really robust and uh, has a lot more to it than this, but this is a pretty neat example. Internal state is, uh, is another thing that is a concept that seems probably a little bit obtuse at first because, well, we, you have properties, and those come from the outside, and you have state that, yeah, you can also affect it from the outside, but you're really, like it says like in big bold letters in the React docs, like, like 
initializing the state object with properties that you inject from the outside world is an anti-pattern, don't do it. But it actually lets you, you know, it gives you a place to do some of the bookkeeping in your views that otherwise is just kind of like lying all over the place. One of my favorite analogies for describing code is, is like a junk drawer because, you know, you have like, even in the most pristine projects, sometimes you just have a whole bunch of shit lying around. And like, you have to have a class that's, you know, two or 300 lines long just because it's doing something that complex. And, you know, the more that you can kind of organize and, you know, shuffle that junk around, it, like the appearance of organization, it actually does lead to things being a little bit easier to understand. So, uh, you know, in, in this example, you know, this would be a, uh, you know, something for, you know, toggling whether or not something is, something is hidden in the UI. And, you know, you would wire this up with a, with a click handler or something. And, you know, just by the act of, you know, kind of touching the state object, it'll cause a re-render, but it'll cause a really smart re-render where it's just going to bump the, property, the, the properties that have changed. I put this slide up again because I, I really want to impress upon you that Big Bang rewrites are not only terrible, they're usually not even possible. So, like, take this with a grain of salt. Like... Ember and Angular and, and React are, are all fantastic. But the, the main thing that makes React stand apart from Ember and Angular is that you do not have to rewrite your entire application to, to benefit from it. Like, Ember is really great, and I encourage the teams at QuickLeft to start and do projects with Ember because I think that it has a lot going for it. We do also do a ton of work, work with Angular projects. And... You know, they, they both have their merits, but what's really frustrating to me is that, like, if you have a big application that you've been, you know, pulling behind you for a number of years, you're not going to rewrite the whole thing in a day. No matter how many, you know, kind of CLI helpers that it, comes, it comes out of the box with. So being able to do things progressively is a really big benefit. And I think that, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, not only is React, you know, representative of doing something really modern and really novel, but it's also something that can be progressively uh, factored into old code. And JSX is actually pretty okay. You know, it gets, it gets a, really, uh, a really bad rap, but I, I would encourage you to, uh, to, to try it out and to, and to use, and to, you know, make a little side project that uses React or something. You might really like it. And let Facebook solve the fucking hard problems. Like, you've got shit to do. Like... <laughs> Right, <laughs> like focus on writing your app. Don't f don't spend a year fixing performance problems because even though like that led us, uh, you know, led to us being able to uh, you move a little bit faster and lose fewer customers because of com performance complaints. At the end of the day, it was kind of work that I regret doing because somebody else has come along and solved this problem in a way more clever than I would have ever done. And you know, being able to stand on the shoulders of giants is one of the fantastic things about software. I did that too, I don't know, it kind of like lines up to get, <laughs> right? So that's the React logo and the Backbone logo, clever. That was my talk, thanks everybody.